So, um, welcome. I'm Annabella Pitkin from Lehigh University, and I'm Nancy Lynn from UC Berkeley in 84,000. And Nancy and I um, have prepared a little bit of uh, sort of a conversation for us uh, on the themes of uh, Ressa aesthetic and philosophical theory, um, and which has to do with art and uh, interpretation and experience, but maybe has larger and more complicated stakes that go into both how we appreciate and understand and render literary texts, literary works of art, uh, whether those are um, in the Tibetan tradition or more explicitly in the uh, Indic materials. Um, but Rasa may also turn out to have um, stakes and communicate in ways that uh, refract with our work as translators in more subtle dimensions, maybe sort of less um, explicit dimensions. And so we'll, we'll flag a little bit of that. And we'll also very, very briefly highlight a few themes from what's being called um, affect theory or the turn to affect in many of the Anglophone um, human sciences and uh, humanities uh, and also in other um, European um, uh, intellectual traditions, things ranging from uh, literature but also psychology, um, uh, biology, neuroscience, geography. People are talking about affect in a range of places where you might not expect it. And what people are using the word to mean is often larger and more complicated than the English word emotion and resonates with some of our concerns as uh, translators from Tibetan in very interesting ways. So uh, we'll flag a few of those possibilities too. And in terms of the format, we thought we'd begin with some brief introductions and then um, a little bit of a presentation. In particular, Nancy will give us uh, the sort of common grounding in a shared vocabulary of Ressa, since that's something that some folks in this room have worked with a lot. For some of us, it's very new and unfamiliar. Um, it can feel very technical, um, but it's also a very rich repertoire. So Nancy uh, will move us through some of that shared vocabulary. And very briefly, um, I'll also talk about some uh, affect. And we'll look at some examples uh, as we move through. And then we really want this to be a time for people to share problems and questions that uh, are coming up in our own translation work. Do you want to add any? Other introductory thoughts? So if we could just go around the room as we've been doing in these sessions, maybe starting over here, and have people uh, just briefly say their name. Uh, and if there's a particular affect or Ressa related question or problem or sort of curiosity uh, that you're thinking with, something to do with emotion or uh, the flavor of the material you're working with, whatever brought you to this conversation. My name is Kate Hartman. I work on practices of seeing in Tibetan pilgrimage literature. Um, and I'm interested in the ways these texts kind of 
perception and experience, and I think that Russ and May helped me think about how to do that. I'm Renee Ford. Um, my biggest question is I've been trying to define what is devotion, uh, and I'm really struggling with do I call it affect, do I call it emotion, and how do those words get negotiated in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Sutra Tantra Dzogchen, and then also how do I see it, I'm also working with theories of cognitive science for grounded cognition, and uh, scientists like Lawrence Barcelo use it, have these all these case studies talking about affect, well are they actually talking about disposition, are they talking about affect, is it an emotion, no jump, so. interested in really the discrimination of affect and how this conversation may help me and help others just discriminate more finely somatic um, expressions of and to understand what they're actually expressing. I think this comes up in all kinds of practice situations and also even in philosophy. I'm Andrew Schelling. Um, I translate Sanskrit poetry, so rasa is at the core of that. Uh, I've never found really anything in Western aesthetics or philosophy that meets that term. And I'd be interested in knowing how this could become sort of a uh, principal vocabulary word in the American English language, the way we've imported yoga and karma and dharma and these other sort of untranslated. David Kittles from, um, uh, from Wisdom Publications. I don't really know exactly what Rasa is. Um, I've certainly heard it and, and encountered, you know, the flavor of taste. But beyond that, I wasn't really sure, so I came here because I was curious to find out more. So I have a vague sense that it could be useful in editing in terms of sort of understanding the author's Rasa uh, and seeing if the word choices and stuff were mm -hmm. consistent. to be a, 
more about. Um, and secondly, um, I'm really kind of curious about um, the, I, I know that the intellectual elite of Tibet, in particular schools especially, incorporated rasa theory deeply into their poetics, but to what degree does that trickle down into the broader Tibetan literary <coughs> world? Mm -hmm. So what is its reach? Are we so focused on Buddhist conceptions of um, ethics, for example, that we're failing to see the rasa um, depicted in them, or is it just not in some text? So that's the question. Um, I'm John Fletcher Tamakara um, Study Foundation. And um, I came here because I'm interested generally in all the Sanskrit roots of Tibetan words, um, Tibetan Buddhism, rather. And specifically, it's, uh, I'm interested in it because through translating tantric texts and uh, society, that's where these, these terms come from. I'm Michelle Martin, and I'm a graduate work in Somehow, when I got into Tibetan Buddhism, I focused on learning the language and studying the room, and also then the whole uh, Shedra curriculum down. And it, it, this was not included in it. And so I'm very interested in looking at how poetic devices work in Tibetan, like the like the lyrics, what kind of corollaries they are. It's still kind of the kind of connecting that's quite there. Wonderful. I can see we already have a rich collection of questions um, and topics that we're interested in. I can't wait to get into them together. Um, I hope that at least some of them will begin to address through this presentation. And I thank all of you who uh, were able to um, sign up in time and respond to our email when we asked also uh, for your interest to give us a preview. It was super helpful for us. So I just want to thank you uh, for that. Um, I myself am not a specialist in Rasa, and neither is Annabella for that matter. But when Holly and and Dominique asked us to do the session. We said yes, and um, you know because I think it's important for our understanding of poetry and poetics. And I am starting to do a little work in it, as you'll see in the example I'll present later on. Um, and yeah, and I can see also there's so many rich conversations to be had about it. So I'm excited to do that. Um, I'd like to start with a, a, a verse from the Cloud Messenger, Megadutta or Mega Sandesha of Kalidasa which is maybe late 4th or 5th century. Um, does anyone have enough familiarity with the narrative to sort of give us the premise? I'd like to keep this a little back and forth. I don't want to just give a straight lecture. So the, what is the premise? Who's the main character or speaker? What's, what's it all about? Um, yes, please. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to talk about Russ in front of you, actually, but <laughs> please. <laughs> simple plot line in a way. There is a yaksha who is some sort of supernatural being who has been exiled by his lord and among other things in his exile he misses his girlfriend and he can't really communicate with her because it's long before the days of cell phones. So he finds an alternative atmospheric way of trying to get a messenger to a message to her which is to speak to a passing cloud asks the cloud to deliver a message to his girlfriend as it moves across India. Um, but then it really becomes a sort of excuse for him to describe the sacred terrains of India so the cloud knows where it's going and recognizes the 
Mars. And most of the poem is about descriptions of the, uh, you know, charged landscapes that have been charged by mythological events or people or beings or whatever. And in the end, uh, we have no idea what really happens to the Yaksha and his girlfriend. Thank you so much for that wonderful synopsis. Um, I'm going to now try to uh, recite the, or read the verse for you. Um, uh, it's in Manda Kranta meter of 17 syllables per line, and uh, which I haven't recited in a long time, but I think it's important for us to hear the sounds of the poetry, um, even for people who haven't studied Sanskrit, just to hear it. Kartum yacha prabhavati mahim uchalindram avandyam tachutvate shravana subagam garjitam manasukha akailasad bisakisalaya chedapateya vantaha sampatyante nabasi bhavato rajaham sa sahaya. So, um, can anyone please volunteer to read the English translation um, by Eagle Bronner and David Shulman? Because it's also important to hear translations out loud, right? Oh, okay. You've been commissioned, if you would. Your thunder alarm makes the earth teem with mushrooms. Its roar is music to their ears, kindling a yearning for Lake Manasa, the regal geese bearing bits of lotus fiber for their journey. Thank you so much. Uh, this um, Kalidasa's work has been translated so many times, but I think this is a really beautiful translation of this particular verse. So I wanted to share it with you. But I also want this to be a way to um, begin our conversation um, without really getting into the terminology and all the stuff on this handout yet, but just to look at this and sort of hear it and think about what sort of um, effective responses um, come up when, when you read this or hear it. Thrilling. Thank you. Anyone else? I think also like the metaphors that carry through in the English translation, like especially the attention to like thunder and then roar and music and like and then to keep company, like it's this kind of sense of um, yeah, the, the the metaphors kind of carry through and that's mm -hmm. beautiful. Like that, that also makes it really a, a kind of powerful piece. Yes, indeed. Adam. <laughs> can you can you unpack that a little bit for us? Can you tell us a little like bit about that? The thunder making the mushrooms, the earth team with mushrooms, this is like the quality of the greening of the earth to the mm -hmm. point where everything is so saturated that even the mushrooms are just popping. Yes. Thank you, but I think also, you know, what Anne and Nicole have been saying have all been playing into this monsoon imagery, you know, the, the sort of fertility of the earth with the, the, the damp, moist mushrooms. The lotus is also very moist. I mean, have you, have you ever seen lotus roots and lotus fibers, like really looked at them? They're in season right now. <laughs> Go buy some lotus roots if you can at the market. I highly recommend it. Take a look at that. But um, so anyone else, would anyone else like to comment? Yeah, Heidi. That's wonderful. You're talking about the motion and also the yearning that comes with that, right? Um, 
And because, you know, this is, let's remember that the whole premise that Andrew explained to us of the yaksha missing his beloved, right, and being far away from her in that distance, you know, this imagined movement of, you know, seeing the geese do their migration. They, yes, they really crafted this. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I resonate a lot with the earth teeming with the yes. teeming mushrooms. And I think mm -hmm. part of trance which is famous for mushrooms and you know, the thunder happens when it's warm and moist. And that's yes. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think as Adam, as you're leading us towards earlier, is this kind of um, convention of, of of Sanskrit poetry of the monsoon, right? The monsoon romanticism, as you called it, and to have this kind of imagery, perhaps not this particular these details, and you pointed out the mushrooms and the lotus fiber, but um, they come so beautifully together here. Um, but it's this it's a season for lovers, right? That's the kind of understanding so so we're also starting to see that people uh, who hear this who may be more steeped in this literature and these conventions will recognize these things that are coming out in this verse that you know I think we can even with no background you can feel some of that yearning and that you know um, beauty of this monsoon season but then for people who are really familiar with these sorts of tropes it comes you in these they're very strong and embodied ways, as we've been talking about, right? This is very active um, poetry in terms of the sensory um, responses that we can have, if, you know, the better that we can imagine the mushrooms and the sound of the thunder and the lotus fiber, you know, and the flying geese in the sky and the movement up and down. Um, so thank you, all of those. Uh, yes? Yes. Yes, and so I also thought it was a beautiful verse to choose for talking about Rasa <laughs> going from India to Tibet. Um, Sarah, did you also? Uh, yeah, I was also going to say the other thing it brings up in there is a feeling of excitement and anticipation, right? So yes. The, like, even though the, the thunder leading to the mushrooms could be seen as a natural, like, it's, it's magical, too. It's, a na it's, it's anticipating the mushrooms without the rain, like a skipping the step of the rain. Yeah. You know, it's... Yes. That's a wonderful reading. Thank you. Yes, and this comes early on. Like, I mean, he's just sort of started talking to the cloud at this point. It's fairly early on in this long extended speech that goes across the whole landscape. So I love how you picked up on that anticipation, which is a imp really important part of this moment that, that this verse appears. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, so some of you may also know that the um, the meter is consistent throughout this whole poem. It's all in this meter, which literally translates to slow moving. So I think it really encourages us to linger and, you know, and when you chant it in this slow moving way, to linger over those sensory effects, you know, um, and to hear the kind of sensory effects of the language itself, like bisikisileya, I love that phrase. The, that's the, um, the lotus fiber is how they translate it. Um, um, but you're just hearing these, these sort of uh, auditory, you know, these oral effects uh, in the language itself that is contributing to the overall sensory effect, Michelle. Well, well also, I mean, it, it just happened to be the two words that are in Sanskrit, but picking up on, on what Wilson was saying, the like Manasarava is always depicted or often be below my high left, like a Yes, mirror. yes. So it's sort of a male-female uh, imagery there that's behind. Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. The geese are heading for Manasarava, but the clouds are heading for Manasarava. I know, quick thought, that also that's a, the most powerful part for me, this kind of like yes. Yes. of that and contrasted with the sky. Yes. 
I totally want to linger over this first because of all these amazing observations that are coming out. And yes, I really picked up on that fecundity as well and that sense of anticipation, right? Um, was there another comment from the side of the room? Yes. <laughs> I think that I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, it's a sort of, I, I think it's early on in, enough in the speech that it's sort of um, part of this perspective, you know, like I'm asking you to do this for me, you know, sort of moment. Yeah. <laughs> Little flattery doesn't hurt in the most poetic way possible. <laughs> um, should, should we move on or are there? Okay, um, I don't have any sense of time, actually. Oh, yeah. Can you try, oh, there it is, oh boy, okay. Um, so, um, on to the bit of more the lecture part of it. Um, so, if you look at your handouts, I have a, the selected timeline, um, which just has kind of like references um, that you can look at, and also this chart. <laughs> and because Russa is not a kind of univocal, you know, um, a historical <coughs> thing, Right, um, and I want to sketch out just very sketchily um, some of that, um, especially I think as it's relevant for Tibetan literature. So um, Rasa is uh, traced back to Bharata um, and his treatise on drama. Uh, so yes, it's um, it his Natya Shastra, and so it's thought to you know it's accepted to have originated in this this work. Uh, on drama um, that is oriented towards the playwright and the performers of that drama. And so I think that an interesting question arises of, is this text theory or method? You know, because I think it's often treated as theory, but my sense of with my sort of limited study of Russ's, maybe it's better to think of it as a method, as sort of handbook. And when you try to read it as theory and expect it to be always internally consistent with, with itself, then you might start to run into some problems there. Um, but it, it seems that it was written for, for performers and for playwrights to some extent of how, how to do their work and then trying to sort of get a, a theory of rest. So he does say things that sound like theory, but it doesn't sort of all maybe fit together as neatly as we might like to just say, just tell me what Rasa is and what is its relationship to bhava, you know, which is a kind of tangled question that I don't, if you could go on about those debates, I don't want to get in, into it too much, but this is just to say that, you know, when you look at your chart and I have Rasa and I, how many translations do I have for it? Those are all translations that have been put out there, you know, by scholars talking about Rasa. And that has to do with different interpretations of the term. I will say that Bharata is usually translated, um, Bharata's rasa is usually translated more along the lines of taste, flavor, and mood, kind of those, those terms, right? Um, and he has this analogy where he compares rasa to this kind of complex um, collection of flavors as he would find in a dish and all those components that go into a successful play. Okay, um, he also has this term of uh, the stai bhavas, the stable states is kind of a literal translation. And you'll see that on the right side of the chart at the top that was also translated into Tibetan. And so you'll see this, this list, I divided in a Sanskrit and Tibetan and you'll see also, I did that partly because the translations in English come out a little differently and the interpretations of those terms, there may be some difference. So I thought it was important to highlight that. Um, but he, but Barta, um, is it, his text is thought to have come out around 300, but you know, it was later revised and so probably, you know, it's maybe revised in the ninth century and that's the text that we have before us today. Um, or some, you know, some version of that um, that's come down to us. Uh, but these lists of the Sanskrit terms um, of the eight rasas, okay, don't look at the, the very bottom one, Shanta, quite yet, but the, <laughs> the eight rasas and the eight stai bhavas come out in this Sanskrit list in Bharata's text. Um, now, what is the relationship between them? Well, I think one basic way that they could be characterized in his text is at one point he says that the rasas have all three of these things, the stimulant factors or the bhavas, the effects or reactions, anubhava and the transitory states of yabhachari bhava. And so the stimulant factors could be something like um, for lovers, let's say for, for Shingara, for um, the erotic or passionate rasa, um, it's monsoon season or it's springtime and there are flower garlands and you know all these things that we're seeing, things that would um, strolls in the garden together. <laughs> you know, these are said to be this is the, the things that stimulate the 
the erotic rasa, okay? Then effects or reactions could be things like verbal expressions, like professions of love, sidelong glances, the kinds of effects when uh, the lovers are feeling this rasa, right? Um, transitory states, um, so things that are not covered under that list of the stai bhavas, there are other sorts of things like um, fainting or, you know, a death is considered a transitory state, illness, you know, things that may sort of come out of like the separation of the lovers, uh, things that might result. But so that's important to note that the, the list and range of that is much wider than, you know, it's not like they're saying there are only these eight stai bhavas, these eight stable states, and that's it. Every, all emotions have to, you know, that's, that's it. But there's actually much longer lists of that kind of range of um, transitory states, anxiety, depression, um, intoxication. You know. um, so, so the rasas, the, the eight rasas, uh, Bharata says at one point, have all three of those, but the stable states don't have this last part. They're characterized by the first two. So that's one, kind of, I don't know, just very basic way you could keep things in mind before the commentators come in and muss things up. <laughs> uh, um, so let's go on because um, Tibetans didn't, uh, at least in Nyangak uh, commentaries, they didn't really take up Bharata as far as I know. It would be an interesting question whether um, that's taken up in the Dugar literature, the kind of literature on drama. I would love to see if anyone's doing research on that. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but so let's move to uh, Bamaha's Kavyalankara, the ornament of poetry. So also in your timeline, maybe around 650, he uh, uh, had a sort of innovation of bringing rasa into kavya, into uh, Sanskrit classical poetry, courtly poetry. And he did this by introducing it as a, a kind of figure, the alankara. Um, I hope you're familiar with like, the gen. I think maybe that word has been floating around enough uh, in this workshop. Um, the kinds of um, literary or rhetorical figures. Okay, and so Bamaha's text has just brief statements and examples, um, but I highlight it in part because, in part because Dundon later on would adopt some of Bamaha's work, and also th at least a few, maybe at least two Tibetan commentators on poetics um, had some exposure to Bamaha's work um, through, the Ratnashri is actually a commentary on Dundon's um, Kavya Darsha, his Nengak Melong. Um, but Bang Lo Tsawa and Fourth Kamcho, we don't have much time to talk about, unfortunately. They, um, they, are where they, they don't seem to have had access to Bamaha's text directly, but they had mentions of the text in, um, in the Ratnashri, in this commentary. Um, and they don't seem to uh, say anything about Rasa, though, from Bamaha. You know, but it's still an open question. I mean, I think it's just a wide open field to find out what's out there. There is actually not much scholarly work done on, uh, on Nyangak and their commentaries in Tibet. So I'm kind of opening up just like things that could maybe be researched. Um, let's move to Dundon's Nyangak Melong, which I think everyone is much more familiar with and hearing of as the kind of um, basic um, manual, uh, let's say, or theory, if you want to call it that of poetics that was translated into Tibetan um, and then adopted for the commentarial tradition on Nyangak. Okay, and so oh, we have a little typo came out there in the Tibetan Nyamdan Gigyan. Um, but so, so one place where he really talks about Rasa, this is a seventh century author and his work was translated into Tibetan. Uh, well, I guess I'll get to that. Let's just stick to Dundon for now. Um, Rasavat Alankara. So again, one of the, it's in his second chapter, right? The chapter of like the 35 Alankaras, the 35 um, um, figures that have to do with meaning. Okay, it's the 18th in that list. And he gives an example here. Um, would anyone like to read it? Read this example. Should I just read it? <laughs> Okay, the one who dragged Draupadi by the hair before my very eyes, here he is, the vile Dushasana. And now that I have caught him, he will not live a moment longer. I actually should have read a little more angrily. <laughs> um, because that is the, the example for it, and it's a sort of a story, a anecdote, a reference to the Mahabharata, right? Um, in this moment where he's lost the dice game, and you know, Draupadi is going to be, you know, dragged away and so um, this is one place where we think of Dundon as being very highly structured if you've done any study of that second chapter and how he lays out all the alankaras and sort of seems to come across in this prescriptive and quite technical sense so it's important to keep that 
in mind that sort of usage and then the familiarity with Rasa or uh, Rasa Vat here in Yamden, right? Um, now, the other way that Dundon really treats the notion of rasa is in his list of the ten gunas, the ten qualities, and that's in his first chapter. It's the fourth in the list of ten, and it's called madhurya guna, or nyembe yunten. Okay, and so this is his, um, uh, his comment on it as translated by Sheldon Pollock. A poem is defined as sweet uh, when it has rasa. Uh, rasa is found in both the language and the subject matter, and insightful people became intoxicated by it like bees by honey. Um, so this is actually a much more open, uh, I think, kind of uh, explanation of what rasa is in poetry, like whether it resides in a certain particular figure of speech or whether it is in is a quality of the poetry, which we could translate that more literally sweet, but also tasteful or elegant. And he breaks that down into language and subject matter, which the commentator's gloss is shabdan uh, artha, right? The sound and the sense. And he explains it further as sound being things like we could translate a little roughly into English as alliteration or assonance, the sound qualities. And also, um, the absence of vulgarity, gramyata, in expression. And gramyata, I mean, that's like, you know, uh, the gramya, the village, right? The absence of that <laughs> talking like a crude villager. And he has a, uh, what is his statement? It's like, um, you know, I, I want you, why don't you want, I want you, girl, why don't you want me? <laughs> okay, that's his vulgar expression. And then his, you know, poetic um, counterpoint. The god of love, that wretch, shows me no pity, but happily he bears you no grudge, my slow-eyed girl. So this kind of elegant, you know, locution, the kind of indirect speech. Um, and note, you know, a lot of these um, examples are a about erotic examples. I think that is actually really important to, to note. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? Or I feel like I want to move quickly, so we, we have so many other things to discuss. But yeah. <laughs> For, for Dundon, you know, this is his, right. So for Dundon, sorry, I should back up. So under the rest of Alankara, that's where he lists those eight um, that you see that, that Bharata, you know, is attributed to Bharata, that list of eight. He has examples for all, he doesn't have examples for all of them, but he lists all eight and gives examples for some of them. So that's like going back to like the list and the categories. And then here, I think, you know, when he's talking about Rasa, it is in this kind of more, general fashion. Is that sort of getting at your question? Yeah, I was wondering if it, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, Does it mean like the manner or the, the general feeling of a poem? Um, so, so uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because he gives fairly specific examples about how it might happen in like a single verse or statement. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we might have to do some interpretive work. Um, for that, yeah, it's, he's not always, it's not, it's, his text is fairly short. I mean, it covers a lot of topics, but on each topic, it's fairly brief. So in order to sort of unpack that meaning, I mean, there are commentaries, and honestly, I haven't really gotten into, like, fully into the commentary literature to see the range, but they, because these, the other thing to note is these appear in different chapters. They're not discussed in relation to each other, like Rasava Alankar and Madhuri Gunan. Dundon and I, I don't know about his commentators, but generally you talk about what's in front of you in that part, you know, in the chapter. And so that's also a problem with Ressa's and Bava's, frankly, and Barta's work is that he discusses them in separate discussions. He doesn't quite, you know, just have this sustained, okay, you know, we're going to talk about them in connection with each other. So, um, I do think it's yeah. fair to say, though, that Ressa has different meanings in different contexts. So yeah. it's not, there is no, like, one, that's how I understand. There's no one rasa like theory. There's like a conversation that's going on for like a thousand years over this stuff. Yeah. And and then you, and then I know they're going to talk about this. So I'm not going to say, but then you get the problem of like later translations and how Tibetans interpret this stuff. So like, but like Dundon's text really clearly has like the theory part of rasa, like the kind of general kind of this stuff at the beginning first chapter, and then the technical kind of like practice this way, right. like this is how you use this stuff in the second chapter. So it's like like theory and then method, like practical application in the second chapter. And so 
as yeah, well. Yeah, and thank you for saying that so clearly. You put it very clearly. Um, okay, I think we'd better, so we can say more about the history of Russia and Tibet. Um, so Sakya Pandita's Kejuk is really um, an important moment where he um, uh, paraphrases or translates large sections of Dundin's Kavya Darsha. Um, and also, um, as Jonathan Gold argues, develops his own sorts of theories about Rasa. Uh, so, uh, and I'm just pulling from Jonathan Gold's work for this, um, and you can read his book, Dharma's Gatekeepers, and also refer to his dissertation if you want to kind of get more fully into it. But um, the interesting thing about Sakya Pandit is even though he works so closely with Dundon for other things about poetics for Rasa, he doesn't cite him, and he really seems to be drawing more from a, 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 another Sanskrit commentator named Boja. Um, uh, especially in two features um, that Jonathan notes, and one is uh, whether it's proper or improper to combine certain verses together, and whether that means in a, in a single verse or be you know more broadly than that. I think you know I don't think he spells that out so so clearly. Um, and the other is that uh, Boja had this um, this theory that the fundamental rasa is Shingara, um, which gets translated as real gig in um, Sakya Pandita's Kejuk, which is maybe not quite the same as, you know, like the erotic rasa in this list of the eight moods, but as Jonathan at least um, wants to interpret as emotional intensity, the kind of passion or emotional intensity that underlies all of these emotive moods, okay? Um, but, you know, it's hard also, I think, to escape that the connotations of Shingara when you hear that word or rulgik as it gets translated into Tibetan, I think we need to, eh, more, more grounds for discussion. Okay, Sakya Pandita also um, says there is a ninth rasa. He's not the first person to do that. Some um, Sanskrit commentators were also doing that. Um, and that is the Shiwenyam or the Shanta rasa um, uh, of tranquility or peace, right? Um, and Jonathan suspects, because of his wording about that, that he may have gotten that from the Hevadra Tantra, which is also <laughs> another interesting, I'm glad that people are bringing up um, the mention of rasas in tantric literature, um, because there may actually be connection how then Sakya Pandita is thinking about this. Okay, um, more that Sakya Pandita accomplished in the Kejuk. He said that there's a Dharma rasa and worldly rasa, and he, he puts these in terms of examples like Chu Kipawa, Jikten Kipawa, um, the uh, heroic or the, the violent or fierce. Uh, they can be subdivided. So, heroism uh, that is dharmic is practicing the six perfections, right, uh, her in this heroic manner. Whereas uh, the worldly Jikten Gipawa would be you know, things we might imagine of being heroic in battle in the face of your enemies. Okay, and so he goes through these sorts of examples uh, for these different rasas. He also says, uh, I think he, uh, it looks from my reading of Jonathan Gold's work that he's really uh, emphasizing the compassionate and tranquil rasas, Ningje and Shiwa, right? Um, uh, and I think there's a strong implication that these are more appropriate for Buddhist literature, you know, which is a really key point, even if he doesn't write, come right out and say it, but just by virtue of his attention to those rasas. And he also says they should not be um, mixed with other rasas. Um, and uh, he has this um, statement at one point that Jonathan translates as, the noble ornament is unfabricated, Machuba. And by unfabricated, he seems to be saying that it's um, these compassionate and tranquil rasas should not be mixed with the other rasas. That seems to be the context of that term. Um, okay, so unfabricated, like what is said by parents to a suffering child. Examples of compassion should be understood by looking at tamjidro uh, and tranquility by looking at the Iron House Jataka. So tamjidro is um, the Tibetan uh, translation of Vishvantara, right? The Vishvantara, the Bodhisattva. Um, so is he talking about narrative here, or is he talking about sti the style of these, or is he talking about both? Open question, he doesn't elaborate, neither does Jonathan, I wish he had, but you know, um, something for us to think about. Um, very quickly, uh, Sakya Pandita does not fully translate Nyangak Melong, so that was done um, by uh, uh, people who were sponsored by Pakba, by his nephew actually, just a little bit later. Um, so they, they translated 
um, that and also the Jangjut Sambe Dokje Pak Sam Chishing, which um, joined Nyang Ah Melong in poetics curriculum as being this kind of um, exemplar of poetry. Uh, it's a collection of 108 Avadana stories written in Kavya style by Shemenja in the 11th century. Uh, so I just want to highlight um, that both of these texts were translated by the same pair. They were canonized in the Tenger, and um, having the full translation and availability uh, meant that then commentaries and adaptations of uh, these works could flourish in Tibet. Okay, so Ching Ponya, um, and I'm sorry, this all looked the Tibetan came out right on my laptop, but maybe I have some older version. No. Oh, yeah, maybe when it converted to the f to see the full slides. Um, so, Chingi Ponya, so Megadu to the Cloud Messenger was translated into Tibetan as well. So, I want to say a little bit about that. Um, there is a really fantastic dissertation by someone named Erin Epperson, um, just completed last year at the University of Chicago. I'm relying on her research for this part of the presentation. I highly recommend, if you're interested on Russia in Tibet, read her dissertation. <laughs> it's really good. Um, so, and it really important, you know, just fills this missing hole in our understanding of Russia in Tibet. So one of the things she argues is that the translators, these three, um, Zhang Zhuk Tsemo, by the way, was the nephew of Pang Lotsawa, who wrote a very important commentary on Nyangak Melong. Um, and this Kashmiri pundit, they uh, somehow <laughs> got a hold of <laughs> and got to help them translate this. Um, and um, someone else, I think, Nam Kazangpo, also at Sakya Monastery. Um, so, but Epperson, um, Aaron Epperson, um, argues that these translators tone down the erotic rasa. And that's why she chose, actually, put uh, under Gikpa in um, the Tibetan. Um, I went with her translation of passionate, and she, I mean, both she, Jonathan and Aaron, I think, sort of think that there's some action going on with the Tibetans um, who are working with Russia to tone down those erotic aspects, and so they prefer to translate Gikpa as passionate and not as erotic when it's appearing in Tibetan literature and theory and you know, commentaries. And um, she also thinks that in The Cloud Messenger, the translators are emphasizing playing up the compassionate Rasa. Okay, so I'm not actually gonna go through the examples she did in her dissertation. I thought it would be more interesting to look at a different verse and then kind of like see what we make of it. You know, the, um, looking at the, the translation from Sanskrit and then her translation from Tibetan um, to see what you think if there are differences between what's going on in Sanskrit versus Tibetan. So I don't, should I take the time to read this again, <laughs> the, the Sanskrit verse? Actually, the sound is really important. Okay. Angi nangam pratanu tanana gada tapte na taptam sasri na shudutam avirtot kantam utkantite na Ushna chvasam samadhi kataro chvasina dura varti sam kalpaistai vishati vidina varina rudamargaha. So you can see the the play of sound and repetition of sound is really important, and you can see that also in how this translator Nathan, it's from an earlier one, um, did that. Um, would anyone like to read the English? Please. He far off hostile fate blocking his way. By your wish joins his body with your body, his thinness with your thinness, his pain with your intense pain, his tears with your tears, his endless longing with your longing, his deep sigh with your sigh. Thank you. So um, David Damrosh uh, calls this the tonal climax of the poem, and I'm sure he's not the only one to think so. Um, as uh, the Yaksha is telling the, cl the cloud, when you see my lover, this is what you should say to her. Okay. Um, so to feel the, that um, longing and the pain and the intensity of this erotic rasa it just comes out so so intensely here right so let's look at should we talk about this a bit before going to tibetan or do you want to see the the tibetan right away okay okay um so oh boy sorry <laughs> should i just try let me see no it's still not it still doesn't come out yeah i'm so sorry about that it was prepared yeah, on a different, readable. okay. Um, so for this, 
Oh, no. What I, I okay. Um, so I have here the Ep Epperson's translation of the first three lines only because I have a bit of difference with her about the last <coughs> line. Um, would anyone like to? I feel bad about the, the Tibetan being like not quite um, so clear. I don't know if I have it. Does anyone want to read it? You can just read it off my sheet of paper. Or is it okay just to look at it? What would you like to do? I just put up the first three lines of uh, Aaron's translation, and um, would anyone like to try to fill in the last line? Um, so it's a little tricky, uh, or should I just, just to save time, should I just? A uh, uh, the a thief or chomkun? Uh, it's a thief or robber, right? The chomkun. Sorry, that vowel just got <laughs> pushed up there. Maybe do you want to say what you think? Okay, you so. Yeah, we can talk about the contrast. Yeah, so um, I translate that as the road is blocked by thieves who stole their merit, and so they join in pleasure only in their minds. And I added only for, for emphasis, right? Um, yeah. You must seem to Yeah. Can we toggle back to the sentence? Yes. <laughs> Pretty different? Okay. Can you talk about that? What was that? I mean, there's no thieves in there, is it? Like, no, no thieves, definitely yeah, not. Definitely um, not. Yeah, there's there the... Lots of thieves on this bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's no merit either, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's ner no merit to be stolen by thieves. There's no there, there is conjoining here, but it's not like there isn't any in the Tibetan. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. So... Yes. So you're picking up something yeah. very key here, exactly. Which is that's kind of Aaron's argument that she did with other verses, but I think is kind of going on here too. Is that this imagined union of the lovers in the Sanskrit? In the Tibetan, you have an, an emphasis on um, the suffering of the respective persons. Their bodies are growing thin while they're apart. They're suffering as they're apart, right? They're crying each in their own, like far away from each other. Um, and you know, in that final line that you know the. the, the, the their merit has been stolen by thieves, and so it's only in their minds that they can be happy together. And so um, this is the kind of transformation where she would say, you know, because they are suffering, it's a pitiable situation, and then you feel compassion for them. So this is how she's arguing that the compassionate rest, I, I mean, that's how she argues with other verses. I'm kind of just extending it uh, to this one, but I think this one's quite powerful also, too. Is it, is it Rajamargam, the end of the Sanskrit? Uh, Rudha, Rudha Rudha Margam. Yeah. Like yes. Yes. And here you have vidina varina, the hostile fate, the vidi. It's not, you know, it's it plays out differently in, in non-Buddhist context, right? Of just like the the fate or the you know uh, what the gods have decreed will happen, right? Whereas your it's your your. Is, is there a, is there a nice yeah. in the Sanskrit? Um, 
Uh, oh, but there's no c c precise, uh, there's no punya, for example, in the sentence. There's nothing. That's quite interesting, because if, if this is correct, then it is saying that their, their separation is, is, not due, is not their fault. Mm -hmm. It's some external force that has separated them, and they're only in their minds they can think of each other and see each other. Whereas if you say it's through a, you know, their, their merit, Right, so <laughs> what, what has stolen, how is it that their merit is stolen? Like, I don't, you know, it's mm -hmm. a very interesting turn of phrase. Well, it's, you know? it's a little bit, you know, uh, so now we, we would translate it as merit, but some, sometimes you could almost uh, kind of transpose it into something like luck. Yes, yeah. so in here yes. It's a kind of unlucky, uh, so the expression of hostile fate isn't so far from that right. idea that somehow the, the, what was good about So yeah. the question though is, would a Tibetan read it as right. punya not meaning merit, like yeah. punya tzakwa, tzakwa, or not? Yeah, right. yeah, and maybe that that ambiguity is being um, deliberately used by the translators. Yeah, yeah. 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 It. yeah. Well, that's yeah. I think that's Aaron's <laughs> argument. <laughs> monks, yes. Yeah. I don't know about <laughs> Sumana Sri, <laughs> but the, the yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He does. Yes. He does exactly. Yeah, it's a title. Yes. Yes. Which I pulled right out of for this presentation. So this has been a so fabulous. Um, I think this is the last slide I have. Um, yes. So um, I didn't mean to take so much time with this, but we had such a great discussion already. So I hope. <laughs> You've enjoyed it. Okay, and Annabelle, do you want to switch back here? Uh, I don't think I need to. Can you just pass me the, I don't know if I'll read that, but no, in case I feel moved to do so. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I want to make sure that, that we have more chances to sort of hear about how this strikes all of you in terms of the particular uh, translation challenges that you um, are thinking about. Um, one interesting thing that Nancy and I talked about, because um, we discussed this quite a bit for many weeks leading up to this conference, and so thinking about this wealth of the tradition that Nancy has so beautifully moved us through, one of the ways that Sheldon Pollock, who's a very famous uh, Sanskritist and a very famous um, sort of uh, putter of rasa the theory into English, shall we say, um, he said if you want to really just try to answer David's question, like wh how do we understand Russia? What, what's going on? You could say that for you know a thousand and a half years in India, philosophers and literary theorists and religious scholars and uh, poets and uh, people thinking about art really wrestled with the question of what happens when a work of art moves us? And in particular, what happens when a work of art moves us to somehow deeply experience an unseen realm or a realm that at least on the surface doesn't appear to be present with us now, but we have real experiences of that realm. And what is that like? How do we describe what vocabulary allows us to describe what that's like? And then also, how does it happen? So the technology, if we could use, I mean, it, it is a sort of an interesting move for me to say technology, right? You guys can push back against that. Maybe we don't like that. But um, going back um, to your wonderful point, right, about can we make rasa into an English word like yoga has become or whatever. So if rasa is a set of tools, these really rich tools that Nancy has, has shared with us, um, then maybe they are in part tools to think about what the heck is happening when we have these kinds of strong experiences? And also, if we think as artists or as uh, writers of literature, in our case, maybe literature and translation, how do we produce those effects? So right there, that might be just enough for us, right? That's a lot for us to grapple with as translators. Um, how to understand the effects that are being produced in the Tibetan texts that we look at, and how then can we as writers or perhaps even working in other media, produce effects? And how can we uh, responsibly, but also creatively, maybe even improvisationally, to use a word that came out of our 
talk with Anne on Friday, um, link the experiences and effects in the Tibetan materials with the experiences and effects that we produce in our own English materials. Right, and this also picks up on the session we did yesterday on longing um, with Sarah and uh, Lara, um, thinking about how in the text might a experience of grief be produced in Tibetan and then again in English. Um, so that's one quite rich set of questions for us to consider. Um, and then there are also some very uh, difficult and challenging problems, but I think very rewarding for us that Nancy also flagged um, that have to do with questions we still don't know the answers to about which Indic materials became important for Tibetan writers and in what ways, whether it's in tantric texts, in sadhana texts, whether it's in poetic materials, whether it's in prose. I think you mentioned, John, thinking about mm -hmm. prose. Um, where might we see Tibetan writers working with sort of Indic traces maybe even very consciously working with particular um, rasa theory interventions from the Indian tradition, Sapan being you know, a particularly uh, luminous example. Um, so where are we dealing with two sets of rasa theories, right? Tibetan um, ways of appreciating how uh, um, literary and other artistic experiences work and ways that Tibetan authors were doing this themselves with regard to the Indian theories. Yeah, and maybe I have one more layer to add, but just pausing there, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts of how this then informs how you think about your own work. Yes. I just want to understand something you said because it tickled me very much. I think you said how words, art evokes unseen realm. Mm -hmm. Now that's very profound on its surface, but I want to understand when you say unseen, what are you referring to? Because I've got two different meanings in my mind. But what are you saying when you're saying unseen? Yes, so um, that's really a big problem, isn't it? So I use the vocabulary of art and aesthetic experience, and so much of our conversation about Ressa is at that level, at that register. And that's really significant, I think, for us as translators, um, maybe even we could say if we're translating explicitly, for example, Buddhist works, where it is meaningful to say that the writer has um, Buddhist ideas in mind. And sometimes, as we've just seen, that may mean that um, some parts of an artistic repertoire aren't being used, right? Or at least they're being complicated. And the Shungara rasa, the erotic rasa, is particularly uh, complicated in this regard. And on the other hand, clearly, the kinds of experiences we can have through the medium of a text or, you know, thinking about pictures um, and other artistic forms, those experiences have to do with what we could call religious experience, right? Um, or philosophical uh, insight as well. And we really can't separate them, right? So if we think about um, the work of someone like Stephen Collins, thinking about the imaginary, the large repertoire of images and associations and figures that people participating in a textual community share, then the repertoire of the artist and the repertoire of the religious teacher clearly intersect. Maybe they don't 100% sort of tunchik overlap, but they very much um, share large areas, right? And great uh, writers and thinkers in religious registers use the repertoires of art to produce emotion, right? And to produce experience in their um, audiences and vice versa. Um, so maybe I don't want to clarify what I mean by the unseen realm, but to say that, that this is the open question, right? And the reason that I thought we might want to briefly think about an 11th century Kashmir Shaiva uh, devotee, Abhinavagupta, who's on uh, the list that Nancy gave us, who's a sort of famous Ressa theorist, Abhinavagupta is very interesting for us to think about, not because he was so obviously embraced by Tibetan authors. Um, I don't know of much evidence that he was particularly influential, 
But for us, trying to understand what we might do with this Russia terminology, this Russia technology, when we think about Tibetan materials, Abhinav Gupta wants to use Russia theory as a way to talk about his own religious experience. And he wants to claim that there is a parallel between what it's like when you have this experience of taste. The taste uh, is a process. It's not that there's something in the words. There's not a sort of substrate of rasa. When you suddenly are moved by that verse, the movement that you experience discloses itself to you directly. The minute it has disclosed itself to you, that's the experience that you're having. And this, he says, Abhinavagupta says, is the experience we have when we have an experience of enlightenment. That is the, the experience we have of transformational religious uh, insight. So it's not that aesthetic experience sort of necessarily is transformational religious insight, but the faculty, the, the nature of that disclosure is the same uh, kind of uh, experience. So that's very that, provocative to think about, yeah. Century um, gay look writer uh, called the Cape of one of the Cape of Nisong of the 20th century, like revives Tibetan studies in China. He writes this um, very important commentary on the Nanak Tidun. And his explanation of Baba is he gives this, um, this uh, example of it being a, a, a psychosomatic experience. Like he talks about Baba in terms of not just like, um, like the idea of greed. But it's like, it's when in your body, when you experience um, grief to the point where you can't help but cry or have tears in your eyes. So it's, it's and then humor is like when you can't help but laugh. Like you just, you have to break out in laughter. You know, so it's like, it, it's, it's really is like on a whole other level of like somatic, mm -hmm. psychological, embodied experience. And that is, I think that's like one of the most exciting parts of this, like where mm -hmm. it really resonates also um, with like affect theory kind of more mm -hmm. generally because it really talks about the body in a, mm -hmm. in a very different kind of way. And mm -hmm. so I don't know, I just wanted to kind of add to that like 20th century Tibetans are actually talking about this too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, yes. Um, particularly because my work is focused on perception of the unseen, I'm interested in this. And you declined to answer, but when you said that you two things came to mind, I'd like to well, you backed into the range, and uh, but I think it's very, very profound and exciting. You could be referring to emotion, but you could be referring to the whole range of mm -hmm. whatever, cell, all sorts of interesting experiential consciousness words that are unseen. How does the language lead us to those kinds of things as well as the emotional. And you were almost implying that you're, whether it's a continuum or an overlap or a simila similitude of some sort, I mean, it's a very, very profound issue that opens up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering earlier, and this now seems related, when I noticed that Vogek got translated as intense emotion. And I was wondering there about the use of the word emotion. I mean, Gek, I get from your chart also this uh, the intensity, but I wonder why the Tibetans translated it as raw. I mean, raw, and that doesn't seem to be kind of expressed in the mm -hmm. emotional intensity. I mean, raw, mm -hmm. sort of playfulness, uh, maybe the spontaneity. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. And, and that speaks to, I think, perhaps Russ and not being limited to emotion, but there's a whole cascade in I can't explain the role, although I wonder if one, s one small reason might have been to distinguish it from Gigba because he's using Gigba for Shingara Rasa, and then he's saying this uh, as Shingara Rasa as part of a list of eight, and that's a certain one kind of Shingara Rasa, and maybe he's trying to say this is another kind of Shingara that is under, you know, you know 
ha having to do with all eight of them and not just limited to the one. Um, I, I don't know, yeah, you know, this is, uh, Sakya Pandit is translation decision, and I'm not sure why, yeah, why he did that. Do you agree or am I missing something? It doesn't seem quite present in English. Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah. Because I the question about the emotion and the embodied uh, is really big, um, and maybe that's something we can turn to uh, now. I know, uh, was it Wilson and Sarah both had some thoughts to jump in? Uh, when you were talking about the mechanics, of explaining the mechanics of how one is moved by uh, a work of art, is there is there anything like the idea of catharsis in, in this kind of theory? You know, the idea of an emotional purification through witnessing certain uh, arts. You know. And my se my second question is, um, what do you think the Im the impact of all this stuff, especially the erotic part, was on the monastic um, scholastic environment of the Tibetan translators. This may go back to your question about the, the carvings of the, the naked faces. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, Take no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Nobody wants to answer that. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> well, I had something different in mind, but, uh, which was to back up to the 17th century. It's a period that Dominique Townsend and I are both working in. Um, where there does, it's, you have to try to interpret between the lines, which is always tricky, but at least among the Gelukpa, there seems to be a tension about whether Nyangak is a proper subject of study. And, um, and there just seems to be a bit of a defensiveness and also proactive promotion on the fifth Dalai Lama's part, I think, to say that this is an appropriate Buddhist activity. But I, so the reading between the lines part maybe is it because of the, this sort of all the Shingara rasa that you see in things like the cloud messenger, even if it's been toned down in Tibetan translation, it's not like it's completely done away with, you know. Um, and when you read Kavya Darsha, Nyangang Melong, it's also full of examples of it's kind of like romantic or erotic um, um, sentiments. Mm -hmm. yeah. um. <laughs> so the question of catharsis is a really uh, interesting one, and I, I sort of shrink from answering it because I feel like I'm not uh, I'm really not an expert enough in Russia theory or um, maybe also in the Greek uh, sort of dramaturgy, but my sense is that they're very interesting interlocutors for each other. The idea that participating in drama is profoundly transformative for the uh, people enacting the drama and also for the spectators, and that this profound um, transformation that occurs and the audience has, as Anne was saying, a emotional and somatic component that can't be separated, that's kind of a full body experience. And there are these very interesting hints that I feel like we don't know enough about, about how important drama was for the Greeks religiously. I feel like that's sort of been interestingly left out. That's sort of a side uh, question. Um, one thing I think might be a difference, but this is a question I'm still exploring myself, is the idea that the catharsis is a purifying process where the emotion and the, the embodied reactions sort of move through you and then they go away and then you're sort of um, calm and purged and you can see why, why that would be very compelling as a description. I'm not sure, at least for a lot of the um, later uh, resikas in India and maybe also for um, Tibetan uh, writers and artists, I'm not clear that what people want is the aftermath of the experience. I think that there's a lot of interest in the um, experience itself. And I was looking at this, um, maybe I won't read it out loud, but people like Abhinav Gupta are very interested in the disclosure itself, the, the sort of resyamana, the, the process of ta the resic experience. Um, not so much in um, using it in an instrumental way as a method to some other experience. But that's, that's just my kind of first take, and it's really a good question for us to explore. Yeah, um, Sarah and then Michelle. Um, so thinking about Abhinavagupta and the way that he connected um, aesthetic experience with liberation, 
-hmm. leads me to thinking about the Tibetan expression, ro chitu gyu, right? Yeah. Became of one taste, which yeah. is a way of describing liberation mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. uh, the disciple's mind merged with the guru's mind and they became of one taste. And so do you read that as a kind of Tibetan way of uniting rasa with liberation? Um, or does that have a different uh, origin as that enters into Tibet, um, since Abhinav Gupta doesn't seem to have had such an Im impact on mm -hmm. Tibet? And then, but, but this is a specific thing, but more broadly, I, I still really ponder on the subject of rasa in Tibet. Um, is this limited to Kavya? Mm -hmm. Or are we not seeing the fact that rasa is much more pervasive in Tibetan literary works? Mm -hmm. Or is it limited to Kavya? Like, where is right. it? You know, and the, we've been going, um, talking about that question, and also, is it, what does that mean to say that it's in it? Is the author, you know, <laughs> has the author put some in it? Are the readers reading something in it? Or are we reading oh, rasa into oh, it, yeah, right? There's the three things also. Yeah, yeah.